So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And again, thanks for joining our webinar, Breaking Down the Barriers to Cloud-Based Payment Solutions today. My name is Mario Galatovic. Uh, I'm working at Utimarco as Vice President uh, for Products. And I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. This note, uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be made available soon on our website. Before I begin or we begin with our webinar, please let me invite you to share any questions you have as we go through the slides and the discussions to share your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom and we will answer those questions at the, at the very end of the session today. Now let me please introduce you to our um, great and fantastic panelists for today. We are going to be uh, listening to Darren Busby, who is our global head of sales for MyHSM by Utimanko. We are going to have the chance to understand from Dimitri Yatskaya, who is chief technology officer at OpenWay, which challenges OpenWay sees. Also, Ilya who runs the CTO office of Credorak is telling us about his view and Credorak's uh, positioning on the market. And we have the, the chance, or we had the chance to also invite Silvinas Barisis, hopefully, sorry for maybe pronouncing him uh, wrong, who is head of, re of the retail banking practice at Saland, and he's going to tell us, let's say, the more analyst view on, on payment out of the cloud. But before we start with our discussion today, let me quickly walk you through who Utimarco is, where we are, and what we do. Utimarco is a traditional HSM vendor being based in Europe, in Germany, with a very long standing history already. Utimarco was initially founded in 1964. We are, privately, uh, we are owned by a private equity. We, in the meantime, have more than 400 people, employees around the world. We made around 83 million in Euro last year. Our, as I mentioned before, our main headquarters in Germany, our second headquarter, as we call it, in the US, in the Bay Area, with offices almost everywhere around the world. Yeah. Our story basically is about creating trust for the digital society. We have around more than 1,000 customers, signed customers globally in the meantime. Uh, we have a quite strong reseller system integrator network, which ends up somewhere between 200 and 250. Our solutions are used in more than 90 countries. Uh, yeah, and as I said, we have a global uh, scalable uh, organization. We are a global scalable organization around the world. Um, where is our portfolio playing a role? It's all about identity, lifecycle management for keys, for crypto, for enterprise security, payment security, and data analytics. Our portfolio has potentially, or the, for sure, we are the, high, the leading company when it comes to certifications, for security certification. Either we speak about FIPS, PCI, or also EIDAS, or, the, or very local certifications, like, for example, NITIS in Singapore. With having said that, I'm ready to hand over uh, the word, the, the slides to Darren. And Darren, please go ahead and introduce my HSM by Utimaku. Well, thanks very much for the introduction there, Mario. It's a pleasure to be uh, on the, uh, the event today with uh, our partners, OpenWay. Um, Credorex, who are a joint client of ours, so we should get some great feedback from them and, of course, sell it. Um, so for my role, I look at the sales at uh, MyTSM. Uh, we've been going for about two years now. And at the end of last year, we were acquired by Utimarco and now part of the bigger family. So for those that haven't heard of us, essentially, uh, as the name says on the tin, you know, we provide a fully managed service for payment HSMs. It's not just hosting, racking and stacking HSMs. It's a fully managed service. So we take care of most um, the vast majority of all the responsibilities uh, around payment HSMs. Um, and, you know, the, the, the service itself is a, uh, a multi-vendor um, service. It's fully PCI PIN. 
PCR DSS certified. It's got some of the highest availabilities um, in the market. It's globally accessible. We've been going now for what, just two years. We're in 30 countries already with 100% uptime. So we've got a great track record and the service that we have is very relevant to any company um, in the payment space, whether they're a brand new FinTech or an established tier one bank. Uh, they can equally all use our service itself. If you could just move, uh, move to the next slide, please, Mario. Okay, so without going into too much detail, this is pretty much a helicopter view of the Microsoft service so that we can visualize how it works. So the service itself, we work with a couple of data center providers, specifically Equinix, who most people have heard of, and Sixterra. We deploy our payment HSMs in their data centers globally. Um, so we are benefiting from those world-class providers and all the investment they've made in their data centers. And uh, we stand up the payment HSMs in those, and we in the UK have a, uh, a, a service around that whereby we remotely control, manage, configure, and support all of the HSMs geographically around the world, irrespective of where they are. And our clients can all connect to us, irrespective of which cloud they're deployed on, whether it's a mixture of cloud, or even if they're connecting from on-premise, it doesn't really matter. So it's a very universal um, service that we have um, and really filling in the gap in the public cloud, because as most people would be aware, none of the public cloud uh, providers can support payment HSM. So that is essentially one of the key benefits of our service, plugging that gap. Thank you. You're on mute, Mario. Sorry, thank you, Darren. Um, Dimitri, please take over and introduce us to OpenWay. Dimitri, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dimitri, CTO of OpenWay, and uh, I'll make a brief introduction. Uh, now, as OpenWay, we are on the market since uh, 1995, and uh, we've grown uh, from a small startup to a global multinational company. And uh, the only thing that we've been doing for all these years is uh, making and uh, re renovating and innovating the payment uh, processing software solutions, uh, which we call Way4. So OpenWay is a company, Way4 is a product. And if you look uh, on the main verticals uh, that we cover, it's pretty much end-to-end -end, uh, payment solution spectrum. So we got uh, issuing coverage for all different uh, kind of payment instruments and form factors from uh, physical EV cards, uh, to uh, tokenize digital cards, uh, virtual cards, debit, credit, prepaid, you name it. Uh, then we got uh, important acquiring vertical uh, covering both um, POS, physical POS and e-com and uh, all in between. So that's really what you can call omnichannel. Of course, uh, it's also a lot about uh, running the switching, uh, powering the national switches or powering the banking switches or non-banking and uh, certainly digital wallets uh, for the last uh, around seven years, that's a very important verticals as well. So those are the principal ones, but uh, apart from that, uh, we are really active uh, in a lot of niches, uh, like uh, for instance, multi-currency and cross-border or commercial cards or uh, fleet and fuel payments and uh, telco payments, just you name it, because platform is really end-to-end. Well, thanks to that, uh, we've been rated consistently as number one uh, by several independent uh, rating agencies and evaluators. Uh, the first one was Gartner back in 2009, 2010, then uh, Ovum uh, five years back, and now most recently it's ITE, from whom we got uh, just uh, this year uh, another uh, number one rating quite recent. And in the meantime, uh, as we were one of the first uh, vendors who really managed to enter into the cloud deployment with complete end-to-end -end, uh, payment, uh, payment solution covering both card management and switching. Uh, we've been awarded this uh, Paytech Awards uh, back in 2019 with our customer Infuse as, uh, as the best uh, payment system in the cloud. Now, if you look into our, uh, basically I could talk at length about the customer base. Uh, we have selected a few just uh, for, for sake of that presentation. One of them is our friends, Credorax, uh, who joined us for this webinar today. Uh, and uh, 
Credorax, Ilya would tell a lot about what they do. Well, generally, that's that was our uh, amazing, uh, the very first uh, experience of cross-border on that uh, scale, probably covering most countries in the world that uh, even exist, uh, completely uh, running on all different continents. So in a way, you can say it was already the cloud before the cloud was even, even invented, right? So it naturally just moved into the cloud when the cloud got out there. Uh, and then another one, uh, to, you see the big names like Nexi in Europe, also nice uh, experience. Nexi is uh, a top three acquirer in Europe where we managed to switch to completely remote deployment uh, when COVID uh, outbreak started and delivered on time. Another one is uh, MasterCard uh, where we power their issuing services, um, issuing processing, a uh, really huge platform uh, multi, uh, for multiple banks. And uh, other nice examples, for instance, Network International based in the Middle East, the biggest one in the Middle East, uh, covering a lot of banks with issuing and acquiring services. And the nice uh, digital wallet player, SmartPay, which is becoming uh, Alipay uh, or WeChat of Vietnam with their strong digital wallet offering. So really happy to be with you today. And uh, I'll hand over back to the colleagues to continue the introductions. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Very amazing. Okay, with having said uh, that, over to you, Ilya. Please let us or the lead us through Credoworks. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Ilya. I'm the deputy C CTO of Credorax. Um, Credorax is on the market since, I believe, 2007. And we were the first high tech company to take advantage of the PSD, which is the precursor of the PSD2 directive. We were one of the first financial institutions, payment institutions set up back then in uh, about 11 years ago. Um, as Dmitry had already mentioned, we are very much focused on the cross-border acquiring and we provide services to global merchants and PSPs. We are somewhat tech savvy, I must say. I think we have uh, one of the fastest uh, gateway services in the world. We are deployed uh, geographically very wide to support that, um, which also had its uh, deal of uh, challenges, uh, which we posed to our open way colleagues during implementation. Uh, we are a principal member of Visa Europe, of uh, MasterCard and of Union Pay, and by now we are already are a fully licensed European bank. Um, our focus for uh, solutions is mainly on e-commerce and mobile commerce with an addition of uh, mobile point of sale, which uh, grows rapidly recently. And um, we position ourselves as a fundamental link in the global payment ecosystem to illustrate the exact role that we play in it, let's go to the next slide. Um, so uh, um, if we look at the general uh, open scheme, such as Visa or MasterCard, there are cardholders and there are merchants. Each side is serviced by a separate type of institution. Cardholders are served by issuers and the merchants are served by acquirers. And we are, uh, um, in this sense, an acquirer. As such, we are um, a customer of both OpenWay, with whom we work since 2013, and uh, MyHSM now, uh, Ultimaco, with whom we started uh, this year. With that, uh, please. Uh, okay. Thanks, Ilya. Now over to you, Till. Please tell us about the latest findings about payment HSMs. Thank you very much, Mario. And uh, thank you to Utamako. Delighted to be here, part of this um, esteemed company. Uh, and uh, delighted to tell you more about uh, Salent and also some of the research that we've been doing. So I'm Jules Baratius, the head of retail banking practice. And uh, Salent is, um, oh, here we go. Salint is a research and advisory firm, and we're focused uh, exclusively on financial uh, services and technology for financial services. So our clients are essentially technology and business leaders uh, at banks, at insurance companies, at capital markets firms, uh, but also all of the technology providers. Uh, so vendors, technology vendors, uh, ser services companies, professional services firms, investors. So it's really the whole kind of network and ecosystem of anybody that's interested in what's going on in financial services technology. 
And what we're trying to, what we're hoping to do is to, to, help, to help them equip with information and data to, that's needed to make faster and more informed technology investment decisions. So the way we do that is by uh, running, for example, an awards program, which recognizes financial institutions for their technology uh, investments and, and how they implemented technology creatively in, in various different areas. And as a result of that, we have thousands of uh, technology case studies, um, how banks and, and, and other financial institutions have implemented this. Uh, we also have a large vendor database uh, where we uh, analyze and assess and evaluate and look at all the various technology solutions. Um, we provide um, you know, various different um, emerging trends analysis. Uh, and, and part of the benefit of working with us is, is uh, basic, basically by, by having that network and access to, to, to the network. So you know, we work on the subscription-based model. Our clients subscribe to our research. They get access to all of that information, all of that research and um, access to analysts as well. Uh, so we can always maintain the dialogue. Uh, as, as we say quite often, there's so much more in our heads than, than what we are able to put on paper. So it, you know, that, that, that access component is, is really key as well. So uh, one of the research uh, I've done uh, at the end of last year was, um, was actually looking into the payment HSMs and specifically of the potential challenges of migrating payment HSMs into the cloud. And um, companies like Utamaco and MyHSM very quickly went to the, to the top of that list uh, in terms of uh, being able to offer that solution of the payment HSM as a service. So they've asked me to, to, to share some, some of this, these findings with you, um, kind of almost remind everyone you know, why, you know, what are some of the challenges related to payment HSMs. I think all of us on this call know how critical payment HSMs are. They're mandated by, by the, the, the security standards, so, so you have to use them if you want to offer retail payments. But the challenge is that the cost of running them in, in your own data center actually adds up. Um, you know, not only you need separate HSMs for, for different environments, whether it's testing, production, or backup, um, you know, you have an upfront investment cost, um, you know, you also have the life cycle of, uh, of HSMs. So every five or seven years, you have to upgrade, you know, buy new ones, um, dispose the old ones uh, securely. So, so there's a whole raft of things that you have to do uh, that, that are not only costly, but also require attention from your people. And that's really sort of gets us to the operating costs is that, um, you know, those HSMs have to be part of your data center, consuming data center resources. But more importantly, you have to have skilled personnel to operate and manage not just the actual hardware, but also the cryptographic keys, which is you know, really a big component and, and it does require specialist knowledge. Um, and then on top of that, you have the compliance costs. I think um, you know, colleagues from Atomaco were talking to you about you know, how compliant they are with various different standards. Uh, that is certainly true for, for payment HSMs as well. Uh, you have uh, certifications and audits, so not only just be PCI DSS, but depending on the environment in which you operate, you know, can be PCI pin security, PCI point-to-point -point encryption. So all, all of those standards and procedures need to be documented, evidenced, um, you need to recertify every 24 months. So you, so you can imagine, again, that's, that's quite an overhead and an overlay that the, many companies would just um, quite be, would be quite happy to, to get rid of. The, the, the other big component, of course, of what's happening right now is that the cloud is becoming an increasingly important element of the whole bank's infrastructure. And we survey our banks that we work with uh, on a regular basis, uh, always asking them where they are in terms of their attitudes of adoption of various different technologies. And so, so the, this, this is the data from some of the recent uh, surveys we've ran that um, you know, nearly 60% uh, are being selective about how they migrate their systems to the cloud. So maybe some of the like, things like core banking platforms uh, perhaps still stay on, on premise, but almost 40% also say, you know, we're actually gonna migrate very broadly to the cloud. So the attitudes certainly have been changing just in the last few years. And what's, what's really interesting, I think uh, on, on the second side also, uh, on the second slide is that uh, it's it certainly it's just a matter of time. Uh, I think that most banks say this is just a matter of time before they they start really running in the cloud. And and, and one of the things that um, we see, we see now is that I think in the past it was very much a, a story about hosting and so therefore cost reduction. Uh, now it's becoming increasingly about the agility, speed to market, flexibility. So there are almost sort of people will start realizing different benefits of cloud. 
Having said that, uh, payment HSMs historically have been quite a bit of a barrier to actually move payments into the cloud because, as, uh, as uh, I think Darren said, the, even the, the largest cloud public cloud providers today don't can't offer payment HSMs in the cloud due to the, the spe specific uh, PCI security standards and, and other requirements. So you need an alternative approach. And uh, what Payment HSM as a service does is, is, is does exactly that. Basically, it, it is that alternative approach to deliver, to allow to take the, the benefits of the cloud while still recognizing and, and always staying compliant with all the requirements around Payment HSMs. And so that you know what what's required to build that as as a service. You know what are the building blocks? Um, of course, you still need the hardware. So um, I think as, as Darren mentioned, you know they work with with the tobacco payment HSMs uh, as well as the, the the competitor products. You still need to host them somewhere. So they you still need a data center. And I think uh, Darren again mentioned a couple of providers there. You know Equinix and um, and and Sistera. Uh, essentially, they they allow you to be very close to public clouds and therefore maintain low latency and, and very fast connectivity to that. Uh, you still need to manage keys, um, but I think you know part part of the beauty of HSM as a service is that that key now can be you know key management. Uh, the, the the provider can can help with that. Either essentially offering bring your own key or or take taking it and uh, over and actually doing key management as a service. And there's a whole other raft of services in terms of how quickly you can provision, uh, you know, which which environments do you offer, uh, for which uh, these these providers also differentiate. And of course, one thing that's a given, you know, you have to have is all the relevant certifications and compliance and standards. So, uh, in the report that we did, is we we looked at uh, all the kind of the main offerings that exist today in the market. Um, there were four of them at the time. Uh, it was actually just before Utamaco and my HSM joined forces. So in, in my report, they were reviewed uh, separately, but uh, obviously now it's it's, it's one, one family. But before I uh, finish, just the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, kind of, obviously we're still in relatively early days, I think in terms of uh, payment HSM as a service and then moving into the cloud. Uh, so, so, so you know, one of my questions um, when talking to a lot of different people was, um, where do we see um, the likely early adopters? And and I, we, I, th I thought it was helpful to actually think in terms of uh, where you are as a company. You know, are you an established company or are you a greenfield designer? Are you an issuer or an acquirer? And then in, in terms of what type of solution you have in mind. Uh, so on the company front, uh, my view is obviously if you're a greenfield company, it's much easier for you to start in the cloud. Um, you know, there's a lot of fintechs that are born in the cloud. They don't know anything different. Uh, so, so for them, it's a very natural choice. If you're an established bank that has always run your payment infrastructure in-house, you know, that's, that's a different story. So you're probably more likely to perhaps start off with more of a testing environment rather than move before moving full production environment. Um, the other distinction, I think, is um, is between issuers and acquirers. I think, generally speaking, I, I'd say acquirers have probably been leading the way, and CredRx is a good example of that in terms of really disrupting the industry and being innovative and creative in, in terms of how to service the merchant side. I think issuers are starting to catch up. I think there's a lot of change happening in the issuing front as well, um, but, but I would say acquirers are probably more likely to be first adopters of these, uh, of these services. And then the final point is uh, on the solution is um, I, I would uh, you know again it's probably no surprise is that I think uh, people that work with software vendors like uh, OpenWay uh, they are more likely to be early adopters than, than the ones that have homegrown apps that are probably deeply embedded into the rest of the infrastructure. Uh, part of the reason is because companies like OpenWay you know very collaborate and, and work with providers like MyHSM to, to to make sure that their solutions. Um, can make make use of that and then benefit of these these offerings. So um, just just to summarize um, again, you know this is this is the example of that report that I published, protecting payments in the cloud, introducing payment HSM as a service. It's really kind of acting as a primer, but also uh, over, provides overview not just my HSM and Otomaco, but also uh, other offerings in the space. And you know the extract of that report is uh, the full report is available to sell and research clients, but the extract I think I believe is available for webinar attendees as well. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, I think we're now uh, coming to the moderated panel discussion. Maria, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sil. Very good. Very precise and focused. So, can I please invite all my pen or our panelists to turn on their cameras?
and so that we can kick off our panel discussion basically we are also going to turn off now a screen sharing so in, in order to allow ourselves to, to see our pictures basically our interaction and let, let's continue first with the public cloud, uh, cloud topic Dimitri let me come to you first what are the main trends that you that open way witnessed over the last 12 months and now how this has impacted let's say the payment industry and the customer requirements the market problems for your customers can you maybe take it first and then Right. Uh, good question. So I would say first thing is that uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, due to well-known events, uh, remote has become a new normal. So you don't face anymore that many questions on where is your team, because nobody cares almost where is really your team as long as uh, you have a good connectivity. And uh, at the same time, it really pushed a lot, uh, accelerated a lot, uh, the cloud readiness and the cloud adoption of, uh, of the banking and payment industry. So you see a similar trend in a way, like uh, if you compare the e-commerce adoption uh, at the regular, just natural pace, uh, it, it has been growing, but then uh, all of a sudden there was a huge boost of that. And uh, we actually observe quite a similar thing uh, with the cloud adoption. So I, I believe that uh, the events of the last year and a half uh, they uh, helped a lot uh, the cloud adoption so that cloud uh, has become a new normal uh, rather than something just totally innovative it is really considered as just a new normal and then because it is a new normal but it's quite a recent new normal customers don't yet have a lot of experience with that except uh, obviously those greenfield cloud native companies that uh, zil has mentioned but if you talk to established banks uh, established payment processors uh, they want to learn about it. Uh, so we are, such, we are supposed to provide uh, solutions. We are supposed to fit on deployment models on anything because there is no one size uh, fits all cloud neither. So we have to be flexible on that. That's uh, what we observe for the last uh, certainly 12 months, I would say. Okay, thanks, Dimitri. So spe more specifically, um, what impact does cloud technology moving forward will have on payment solutions. Still, maybe over to you. Well, I think um, I kind of mentioned already a little bit about this. I think um, as, as payments move to the cloud, I think, you know, the, the, the initial premise was to move for cost reasons. But I think now, you know, you get low. I think people are starting to realize it's, it's really, it's about agility. It's about being able to componentize the solutions and put together and allow clients to put together on the fly, you know, the, what, what is it we want to do. Uh, and it's not just the cloud, the hosting aspect, but the whole sort of side of cloud technologies like, you know, you know microservices and API connectivity, that, that's, that's what allows, uh, allows people to do flexibility and agility. The other thing which I think um, why cloud is so critical, and, and it's actually um, another report that I'm working on right now, I'm due to be published soon, but it's actually is looking at the resilience aspects. And I think, um, again, the pandemic showed how critical the resilience of payment systems is. And I think while mainframes uh, you know, are gold standard for reliability, I think cloud can also give you some of the, some of the almost built in you know, elasticity, scalability, and think, look, look at what happened with, uh, with the payment volumes, for example, how suddenly they dropped overnight uh, during the lockdowns, um, how, how different the, the drop was, you know, the, the cross-border volumes versus, versus supermarkets or, or tra travel sector versus, uh, you know, bread making machines, right? So, uh, so, so there's being able to cope with that drastic change in volumes, I think is, is really difficult without, without cloud. Okay. Um, have, uh, with this having said, Darren? Yes, uh, I just wanted to add on to that as well. So one of the other key benefits, I guess, of the cloud, if we're focusing on the impact on payment solution, I guess, is accessibility and search, removing geographic boundaries. So those companies using payment solutions who have operations in different locations have, have really got access to the same data and the same network. And when they're deploying the payment solution, new instances can be deployed in new regions virtually immediately. So there's a clear advantage of those cloud-based payment companies that do business uh, not just in one country, but globally as well. So that I think is one of the uh, benefits that we need to uh, just point out as well for using cloud-based technology. 
Okay. So with companies being created and born in the cloud, what does this mean for, the, for their ability to innovate? And how does this relate to our? Yeah, so for those companies that start off in the cloud, I mean, they've got the benefit that they don't have to worry about managing outdated and cumbersome processes and technologies that are tied to static on-premise systems. So the cash and the commercial and operational overheads, to give you an example of the payment HSN ecosystem that we, that, we, uh, that we provide as a service, that, for example, the, the cost of operating and management is totally disproportionate to the cost of the device itself. So that's just one element of the things that uh, companies need to consider if they want to bring these great ideas to market. So for those that are looking to launch new services and, and be created and born in the cloud, you know, choosing that cloud first strategy frees up that cash and resources that would otherwise be used just to implement and maintain on-premise systems. So that, that uh, cash flow itself can instead be used to focus on that company's core business offering there, whatever innovation, disruption, disruptive technology they have, to be able to bring that market to market very quickly and to adapt and innovate very quickly. So I think it's, it's, that, that's another key benefit as well. So, you know, when, when companies look at cloud technology, they're reaping the benefits by combining the value of the existing platforms, say way for, with the technology that the cloud service providers enable. So that payoff itself uh, provides greater reliability, uh, greater flexibility, uh, to scale up the infrastructure because you're not building in redundant capacity to handle peaks or anything like that. So, uh, and, and the amount of, of investment that the cloud service providers put on their, their service to make them more reliable and, and resilient is far greater than any one payment company could, could invest themselves. So it, it increases resilience, reliability, scalability, as I said, faster time to market. So the economics of moving to the cloud and uh, focusing on innovation really are undisputed. Okay, thanks, Darren. Ilya, with, with Darren's response, what are the, how to say, the, the most common concerns, the challenges payment companies uh, will face or thinking about if they start deploying cloud-based payment solutions or moving their systems to the cloud? I would say that uh... If I am to list uh, the, the concerns in a prioritized way, I think the biggest issue is that a lot of cloud payment solutions and a lot of cloud uh, service providers do not really understand the business. In the sense that, uh, well, let's take a generic uh, infrastructure uh, as a service provider. You, they can configure a lot of things to your requirements for sure but they won't be ready with PCI DSS compliance for you mostly. This is something that uh, only begins to appear on the market now. If we take a cloud solution that, uh, that is uh, generic and it's not directly connected to the payment business, we are still regulated by, um, uh, we're still bound by compliance we need to maintain. And this is something uh, that is hardly understood out there. So this is, I think the biggest, technically we are uh, as a, we are we born a technology company, we have a large technological arm and we are able to move systems and migrate uh, with relative ease. Uh, but the biggest challenge is that we will need to, so we, have, we basically need to tell a lot of vendors are need to be told how to do things so that we are compliant with uh, both the payment specific and the European specific legislation, GDPR for instance. I would say that's number one concern and uh, the rest are uh, pretty common to other companies. The degree of operational control, the resilience and maturity of the solution and, and so forth, the connectivity, but, but these are not specific to the industry. It is the fact that uh, um, it's very easy to throw a bunch of computers out there and solve a, re a really good, uh, provide a really good solution to the theoretical problem of sharing computing power but the gap and the challenge of actually being uh, payment uh, industry ready is uh, not fully understood by, by, by most. Okay, interesting point. Okay, and, and maybe Dimitri, you as considered as a technology solution provider, how, right. how is it possible for you and maybe with partners together to deliver, a, call it a full stack cloud enabling solution towards the market? 
Well, generally, uh, what we learned is that uh, we have to be, well, if we are not born in the cloud, uh, we have to be as good as being born in the cloud, right? Uh, so we have to embrace uh, the cloud advantages, of course, starting with the most obvious one, which is just uh, being able to run in the cloud. There, uh, luckily, as we had already architecture for years that was fit for the cloud, there was not a real issue. Uh, the other challenges that uh, that were really there in the very beginning was uh, where do I place my HSM boxes just pragmatically, uh, because uh, until my HSM has appeared, uh, it was really a serious question. Uh, if I place it in my data centers, how do I ensure reliable link to the cloud? Uh, if I want to place it in my country, is there a cloud data center nearby? So that used to be a serious challenge. Now it's all fine. I just need to look. Where is my uh, where is the closest my HSM data center? So the re remaining uh, piece of the puzzle, but normally next year there should be a solution to that, uh, is that uh, for Visa and Mastercard, of course, you still have to uh, put it somewhere. Um, but you know, uh, in one year from now, hopefully there will be <clears throat> cloud-based access points as well. So that's one part of the challenge. Uh, another interesting. Um, uh, aspects of being able to uh, create a cloud offering is that uh, now by default you are supposed to offer uh, many many different models uh, that have only become possible with the cloud so you are supposed to operate it as much as customer wants you to operate it or you are supposed to stay away from operation as much as customer wants to be on their own if they want uh, you to take care of all PCI DSS compliance, you are supposed to do it. If they want to do it by themselves, you are supposed to give uh, smart advices. So uh, that's what the payment uh, solution vendors are supposed to do, is just to fit all this multitude of different cloud models and uh, do it everywhere in the world. And uh, if you are good at that, uh, then you can deliver a full cloud solution. Okay, thank you. Um... Next question, maybe back to you, Ilya. Based on what we just heard, how does a customer decide, really decide between an on-premise, hybrid, fully managed payment HSM? Well, so we, we used to, we made, uh, I think we went uh, um, from a point when we were using uh, HSM as part of the general processing service to on-premise and now to the managed solution provided by uh, my HSM. Um, I think one of the decisions was definitely the availability of the solutions and the maturity, one of the factors of the decision. Uh, it is, of course, a bit uh, difficult to uh, move. Uh, um, uh, it is, of course, a bit uh, difficult to move from something you've already bought after all the CapEx until you've uh, actually, until it actually burned out especially with equipment, uh, relatively expensive equipments and, and the setup such as the, the payment HSMs. But I believe for, I mean, we never shied away from moving to the cloud or from uh, start launching a new uh, application on the cloud. That was never a problem. Uh, I guess the triggers for this, for our specific move were, uh, quite, were quite obvious. We made some assumptions regarding global stability, which proved to be untrue. I actually have, there is actually a longer story to it, and it's a bit dark. Uh, we have uh, two data centers. One is located in Frankfurt and the other one in the United States. And uh, during the uh, design and uh, deployment phases, we were always joking that the solution is built to withstand a nuclear attack on the Eastern seaboard. At some point in time, um, there was a World War II bomb discovered in Frankfurt about 300 meters from our data center. Uh, which had to be evacuated. Uh, so that was uh, assumption number one uh, broken. And, uh, and then we had this travel freeze. When you cannot actually reach your HSM, you, know, you, you can have absolutely no remote hands whatsoever on one hand. And on, this, on the other hand, you have to have it located far from you and closer to your uh, data centers, which are in turn closer to customers. That's a major challenge and also a major cost driver for us. So, so we looked at this in general, and uh, we saw that uh, we got introduced to the MyHSM solution. And um, from there, it was to, once we understood those challenges we were facing, it was a no-brainer from there. Okay, thanks, Darren. Anything to add to this? 
I mean, it was a very strong statement by Ilya, right? Yeah, I'm quite happy about that. So um, I guess when a customer was looking, you know, they got a choice. Well, they've got three choices, actually, what to do with their payment each time. They either do as companies have done for decades now, and they buy on-premise data service that they need to feed, water, purchase. They've got to have the staff to, to operate them. You know, those resources are becoming rarer. Um, they have to put them in at least two data centers for resilience and have a number of data centers across those. So the list goes on, you know, the, the overhead and such. So they've got another alternative. They can, if they wish, co-locate those, you know, at the data center, Equinix or whatever. And that takes away, I guess, the cost of the data center having their own to a degree, uh, but it doesn't get away from them having to be compliant. They still have to ensure that that environment is DSS and PCI PIN certified. They're still got to have the people to operate them. They're still got to buy the machines up front and have that CapEx. Uh, they're still got to worry about upgrades, maintenance, the, the, the geographic um, reality, as I just pointed out, of actually going to those HSMs and doing stuff on them. So it's, it, it offers some benefits of co-locating, but it's, it's, it's not everything. Or they can choose to outsource it, and that's where we fit in. So it, it, it's a neat model. You know, we take away all of that overhead of the payment HSM. You know, the, these are metal boxes that people often you regard them, you know, they sit in the data center, flashlights. People don't really care about them. They carry on doing what they're doing. But if they stop working, you haven't got a business. So where we are, we've provided a world-class service. You know, we've had 100% uptime since operating it. So for those companies looking to make the move, we understand that there's concerns. They have to do things differently to the way they've done before. But you know, we've got a great track record. We're working with some of the biggest companies in the world uh, who invested millions in their data centers. And we've got some very skilled staff who were well-versed in payment HSMs. And again, it's access to those skills is another benefit of the service that we offer. So those are the three options that companies have, and there's not much else than that. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Darren. So with, with that, I would say we, we go now to the questions on the chat as well as on the QA, and we skip basically the moderated questions. And let me start first with you, Dimitri. There's a question. Hello, is OpenWay compatible with MyGSM and other Ultimaco products like Atala, for example? Great question. Uh, answer is yes, uh, OpenWay has already, well, Way4, our software is compatible with MyHSM. We have successfully run the test. And uh, I'm also happy to announce uh, that uh, from, well, now we are just uh, running the testing uh, regarding the Atala compliance. Uh, and uh, this is a work in progress, but uh, we will be in position to offer uh, Atala HSM interfaces uh, in about uh, one month from now. Uh, so, yeah, you can assume that uh, this is there when you are already running, uh, when, when you're going to start a new way for deployment soon. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, next question on the chat goes maybe to you, Darren. Uh, what are the plans of MyGSM to expand their presence in different countries, mm -hmm. like, for example, Belarus? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we already have a customer in Belarus, so that's a, a quick answer. But in terms of expanding the, uh, the service globally, the, the, um, I guess the beauty of the architecture is that we've decided to work with a couple of global data center providers. Um, and that we have um, created a set of approved processes together with the PCR Security Standards Council when the service was first architected. So we can actually roll out our service very quickly and very easily to any of the data centers of our data center providers globally. Uh, without breaking our PCI certification. So it's a very simple process, well-versed, um, and there's a blueprint that we use for each of those data centers to open up. So today we're in the US, East Coast, West Coast, we're in Europe, uh, UK, Asia Pac, um, looking to open up in Sydney. Uh, so we've got plans for all these other data centers around the world, like anything, it's driven by business demand, uh, but we are there and we have the ability to open up wherever our customers need us to be. Okay. This fits perfect to the first question in the Q&A session. Maybe you just add on, um, how did Utimaco basically get the PC or the MyGSM get the PCI PIN certificate as it usually needs a physical location for the HSM? Yeah, well, that, that I guess is the key reason why the public yeah. cloud providers can't support payment HSMs because you can't turn up at, a, at, a, at Azure and Amazon or a Google data center and expect to do anything there that complies with PCI PIN, it's all dual mandated. 
So as I touched on in my last answer, we've uh, um, created a set of approved processes. So even from opening the box of the HSF, you know, it's, it's, it's dual control. Um, so when we follow that blueprint, then the service is always PCI pin certified. It's a fairly light touch at the data center, it has to say, and we provide an attestation of compliance to all of our clients that they can share their QSA as evidence of our um, certification in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a question, maybe this goes to you, Till. It's just uh, got in the in the chat. What do you what do you think? What do we think? How is latency affecting performance on a fully cloud landscape and payment solutions HSMs? Yeah, I realized I'm on, on mute. Um, I'm not sure, sort of, I fully understand the question. I I think latency is obviously absolutely the key requirement for for performance and. Um, if your data center or the solution you're running is, is far away from the public cloud data center, then potentially, I think Darren, you and I talked about the situations where, you know, an Australian customer trying to connect to European data center, for example, you know, naturally they would experience some latency issues. So, so you try to minimize that. And I think, you know, part of the benefit of working with the providers like MyHSM is that, you know, they have those data centers in strategic locations to serve a broad range of, uh, of, of regions and clients in various different countries to address that issue. It's a question that often comes up, Jill, about latency. It's probably one of the most common questions that we have. Um, and it, but it's not just the only um, consideration when you look at overall performance, I mean, sure, geographic proximity to the HSMs or the payment gateways is a, a consideration, but it's not everything. I mean, we've got customers from Japan to South Africa to South America accessing our HSMs, some of which are they're connected to are still in the UK and Amsterdam. So, and they're operating with great success, but there's also other ways in which the service can be optimized. So we offer a best practice with our clients on how they can optimize the use of our service with the payment gateway. So whilst latency is a consideration, it's, it's not the only consideration. And as I said, we've got a, a data centers in each of the different regions, and if needs be, we can open a new data centers depending on what's needed. Okay, thanks. Um, there's another question on this topic. Is there a, a, a call it a latency metric uh, we can maybe share? Uh, share. Well, that's more like how long is a piece of strain. It depends on where the customer's payment gateway is and where they're connecting to. So, and that can range from single digit millisecond round trip uh, per uh, call. And if the customer can concatenate all those HSM calls per business transaction into a single call to the HSM, which many times it can happen, then within a business transaction, you know, a couple of milliseconds, sub 10 milliseconds is very, very good. It doesn't even move the needle. Uh, but when you're looking across uh, wider distances, there can be latency of say 80 milliseconds, 90 milliseconds, something like that, depending on where the customer is located and you know, various other um, factors to consider there. But you know, within the whole scheme of things, within a business transaction, it's uh, it's uh, ma it's manageable, um, and we've never had an issue before where customers haven't been able to transact uh, in a performant manner using our service, irrespective of where they are. Um, any um, any response to what happens if an HSM goes down? What's the response time? We right. Can... Yeah, good. Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, if you run a wave four switch uh, or well, wave four solution, it's quite straightforward because we always use at least two HSM. So if one is down, uh, we just send a request to another one which is up. And if you like to be further protected, you can add even more than two. Mm -hmm. And just to add on to that, from our service, we uh, we offer as a minimum three HSMs in a group that the client would connect to. Each of those HSMs is always active active across two physically separate data centers. So that's how they can offer five nights availability. So if one HSM goes down, they can always talk to the other two. And on a dedicated service, they can have as many HSMs as they want. Uh, but uh, generally, it's a minimum of three. Okay. Uh... Next question, is there any perception or can we 
basically speak about visas or MasterCard's uh, positioning about cloud-based HSM solutions? Uh, it is neutral as long as you ensure that uh, you pass PCI DSS compliance or PCI PIN or PCI 3DS, uh, they are fine with that. As, uh, uh, at least as per our experience, Ilya, off to you. Uh, yes, I would just, I just, I'm not, I'm not, at, I'm not at ease with the usage of term cloud HSM solutions because cloud HSM solutions in my world are just those un, uh, subpar stuff, well, not subpar, but unfit for this specific use case things that are offered by generic cloud service providers. I saw somebody mention Azure as well. We as a customer considered, took a look, a one quick look at all of those. They're not fit for uh, for processing pins. Um, what really matters to schemes, and that's according to their official documentation, that you have your, um, if, you're, if you need to do the audit, you, if you, your auditor must approve, your dedicated pin auditor must approve the solution that you have. Once you got that, it can be anything in general. Specifically, probably won't be one of those cloud HSMs. It will be something like my HSM solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, Darren, one more for you. Um, are there any plans that my HSM is going to sunset the support of any third party HSM vendor other than Utimaco? No, we are multi-vendor um, as it stands today. So we support, we support both the 81,000 from its marker, uh, as well as the Talus Patient KK um, service in the market. Um, there are other products coming downstream from Uti Marco that will be added in to the Microsoft service, uh, which offers some interesting capabilities around combined and general purpose capabilities on the same uh, hardware. Um, so there are no plans to sunset anything um, on the service in extent. Um, another question for you, Darren. Um, is it faster to deploy in MyHSM compared to a hardware HSM? Without a doubt. I mean, if you were to, um, I mean, ask, ask Credorax, they're, they're, they're on the painful end of this. But uh, from our side, you know, we can get a client connected to our tech service in three working days. And if they want to connect to our, our shared live service, our SLA is 10 working days. If you contrast that to all the things that need to be done, not just to get the physical kit installed, but in terms of the infrastructure, the, the people, the staff, the audits, there's no comparison there. Uh, our biggest challenge with connectivity to my HSM is uh, properly documenting the architecture and the confidence for the security scheme tracking right now. All the rest are um, a breeze. Um, maybe next one to be leaded by you, Darren, and maybe Dimitri. Okay. The remote key entry operations executed in, for example, entering a key different using different components owned by different key officers. Mm -hmm. Do you require some kind of physical device at client side, or is it just software based? No, it's, we we that's outsourced to Microsoft. So we in the in our secure operating center in the UK, we have our security officers who will perform that key generation or key receipt and uh, combination in our secure operating center. So that's the main option is that the top level key management is outsourced to us on behalf of the client. And there are other options if needed where the customer can uh, using a trusty management device do their own top level key management. But generally that function is outsourced to my access. Okay. Right. I mean, not, not much to add from my side. Indeed, uh, if you go for my HSM, the purpose is to outsource uh, uh, this, uh, these things. Uh, that, and uh, obviously, then uh, you don't need to bother about it by yourself, right? Yeah, we take the pain. Okay. And maybe another question, first of all, to you, Dimitri. What happens if the transaction load automatically or suddenly increases? How does it affect the the, the Trends, uh, the processing basically, which also involves the HSM processing. Does it have any cloud or the cost implications for your customers? And maybe then over to you, Darren, how does this affect the HSM customers as in general? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, look, uh, I would answer, obviously there are different uh, models uh, agreed with the customers. Uh, and uh, it's really 
quite tailored uh, to what customer prefers. For instance, if the customer is managing uh, the software by himself, then uh, typically there is a very little dependency on the volume because uh, then uh, it's more a matter of uh, making sure that uh, your cloud infrastructure uh, can either elastically scale or you just scale it up front in anticipation of the peak. And uh, the same concerns the um, HSM throughput capacity, which uh, by the way, most of the cases you just get uh, in such a way that it exceeds uh, your peak expectation. But yeah, Darren would comment more on that. Uh, now, if you run uh, in another model, which is subscription of software as a service model, then obviously it can be more proportionate uh, based to the transaction volume and then there is impact. So it really depends uh, from case to case, of course. Mm -hmm. And just adding to that on, on our service, um, connected to our service on the shared service, each of the HSMs is fully licensed. Um, so customers have um, maximum capacity um, on the actual service. There are no restrictions on their volumes as such. Um, all that happens is, is that we uh, invoice them according to the usage that they have each month. So there's nothing we have to do to the HSMs as their volumes grow. Right. Okay. Yeah, from, from our side, just to, yeah, to add a little bit, uh, the practical tests uh, that we have performed uh, have shown a few thousands of authorizations per second, uh, in, including the cloud. And then in the real life, uh, the faster, well, the fastest we have, the highest uh, one that we manage with our platform is around uh, four and a half thousand authorizations per second and in parallel around 7,000 uh, API calls per second. And really we wish that there will be more and more players in the payment industry uh, issuers or requires who would uh, be happily experiencing this kind of volume. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, next question. What is the added value of our solution for a customer versus the management of Azure, for instance? who claims to have all necessary payment certification. Maybe for you, Darren, first, again. Can you repeat the question, sorry? <clears throat> what is the added value of the MyHSM solution versus the managed one offered by Azure, for instance, which claims to have all necessary payment certifications? Well, I, I've not seen the, uh, the service from Azure, which uh, uses payment HSMs, um, that is PCI PIN certified. I know they have ambition, they have an ambition to provide that as a hosted service, not fully managed um, at some point in the future. Uh, but I don't know where they are on that roadmap. The service that Azure provides today is for general purpose HSMs. It does not support payments. Right. So I think there is a quite a common uh, possible misunderstanding in the industry uh, because uh, there is a perception that uh, if there is HSM offered by a public cloud and if the public cloud is PCI DSS certified, there could be a conclusion that uh, there is a PCI uh, compliant uh, payment HSM, which is not the case at all. It's just a general purpose HSM, which is good enough to encrypt your PAN uh, or encrypt your uh, sensitive customer data on file, but, uh, it doesn't support anything like pin translation or EV crypto verification. It just doesn't support it at all. And, and even if it technically does, you really shouldn't use it. Which brings <laughs> me to another question I can just find, found myself in the chat. Um, having a um, solution like MyHSM as, uh, as part of your offering to your partner ecosystem helps us. We have different because we have partners of different size. Some of them are very experienced in the current present world. Some of them are just getting started. So ha having the option when somebody comes over and says, yeah, we will do pin translation with this. We have this nice, uh, I don't know, Fuma Revet mounting now. We have this nice Amazon Cloud HSM, for example. And this is exactly a very good point for, for us to come back and say, look, you have to be compliant. This is not compliant at all because of the physical access and i think all this was also one of the concerns voiced at the beginning of the uh, of the of the webinar by, by somebody from the audience but but it's like well it's not compliant you don't there is no physical access controls you cannot use it for pin translation but we can show you a service that, that can be used and this is a great help and the great boost for our partners because we've already vetted the service for use 
we know that it is valid and uh, our our less experienced partners are having a smooth ride they just need to implement a very specific thing and move on to to their next challenge that is the major boost to the time to market that we see with, with the the partners okay perfect thanks uh so next question um again for you darren do you offer active active solutions in each major geography for example for north america can we assume coverage in new york and la and in europe perhaps london and frankfurt or such or is redundancy created by spanning over continents no we do offer active active in region so the us we've got data centers in the east coast and west coast san jose and virginia uh, just as uh, washington uh, for our us clients we've also got some latin american companies connecting into those um, and in europe we've got the uk and amsterdam um, today okay and they're all active active as you said okay perfect um how can customers who have their payment solution living in for example aws cloud utilizing the mygsm service ensure pci pin compliance mm -hmm. well using the mygsm service ours is fully pci pin you know we provide the aoc that doesn't take the customer out of pci pin themselves so they're still within scope of PCI PIN, but it does mean that a lot of the burden, the responsibilities are taken over by MyXM. So when we work with our clients, uh, we work with their QSA where needed uh, to provide evidence of that PCI PIN certification that they need. We work with uh, Advantio, they're one of the biggest QSAs in Europe. And uh, there's often a benefit where our customers um, also use Advantio as their QSA, but we can work with any QSA uh, in reality. So the, the, the short answer to that is, you know, it doesn't take the customer out of PCI pin, but it does reduce the burden that they have. You're on mute, Mario. Oh, sorry, somehow I made I pressed the button. Um, how does the Mitis M service cloud um, resist against DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service attacks? Mm -hmm. So we do our own DDoS um, tests and prevention and search, and we've got a report uh, that we can provide to our customers for that. And this all un comes under the umbrella as well as our PCI DSS, you know, all that penetration test and such like that. And if any customer wants any further information, we can provide that. So we have, do have a DDoS report um, as well. So we, uh, that's one of the things that we do. Okay. Um. One more for, uh, I think that's, we, we start with you on this question, Dimitri. How does the MyGSM service differentiate the integration work between Antalis HSM and Ultimaco HSM? All right. Uh, well, if I understand correctly, the question is uh, how different is uh, how different it is uh, to use uh, software like Way4 with MyHSM when uh, you use uh, Dallas HSM behind the scenes versus uh, Ultimaco HSM behind the scenes, right? Yes. Exactly. So the answer, yeah, the answer is you just uh, pick uh, what protocol uh, do you want to use, uh, right? Because uh, as I mentioned, uh, Ultimaco protocols, the native support, Atala protocol is just coming in about a month from now. Uh, so that's uh, up to your preference. And then uh, if you see there is uh, some kind of pricing difference or advantages uh, of one or another HSM, uh, depending on your existing expertise, uh, then it's really up to, up to you to decide. Okay. Thanks for this. Um, Darren, back to you. Does the MyHSM support the Mark II interface? Mark II. I think that's the old safe net, right? Yeah, so what we the protocols we use is the native HShield API as well as the native AT1000 API on our service. So customers have a choice of which one of those that they want to use. There is an emulator, the HShield emulator on the AT1000 as well, which covers a subset. But generally, if people want to make a choice between one or the other, it's the native API that they would choose. Okay. 
Um, are there any customers that require that an HSM being located in a specific country for a legal reason? Well, there are some countries where they have uh, data residency um, laws. Uh, and quite often we get asked by our, our prospects and customers how that impacts them, uh, where those countries um, insist on having uh, data in country. The reality with the MicroSEM service, because we, we operate payment HSMs, uh, when it comes to data residency, is that no data resides on the payment HSMs. So we're trying to avoid that one. And any uh, data that's sent to the HSM is fully encrypted, so it can't be reverse engineered to identify a person. So it doesn't, it's not classified as personally identifying information either. So we kind of avoid any of those uh, concerns around data residency and uh, data sovereignty and such like that because of the nature of how the service works. Okay. Thanks. Um, then there's a, a general question on Utimaco. Uh, how is Utimaco involved in India? Are there any use case references specific to India uh, in regards to Utimaco? Um, Darren, do you like to pick it up again? Yeah, so in India, we are um, currently looking to open up in India uh, with a data center there, uh, and we're currently scoping all the rest of it. When we actually um, press the button for that uh, and actually deploy depends upon uh, customer business case, and there's a number of opportunities we're chasing there. Um, and as and when they are they, they, they close, uh, we'll be able to open up in that region. And the same applies to any other region, really. Excellent. Um, what else do we have here? Um, I think we almost would like to all of them. Okay. Darren, again for you. How the partner ecosystem benefits from selling the My HSM? Partner, so, but we do have a partnership program that we can work with companies. Um, and I can provide more details to those that are interested in becoming partners, either a reseller partner or a referral partner. Um, and I'd be happy to get into any specifics with those that are interested in doing that. Okay, excellent. So with this question, I think we are approaching the end of the session today. Um, so I would like to close the Q&A session. We are going to to stop the recording we are going to share it on our website and i would like to thank to all the attendees as well as the, the panelists thanks for taking your time to join our session and let's stay in touch many thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you.